Welcome to the arena, where sometimes the hardest part is showing up. My name is Linda McLaughlin. Thank you for being here. Pamela Mala Sinha is an accomplished actor, multi-award winning playwright, writer, screenwriter, and classically trained Indian dancer. She's a beloved daughter, sister, stepmom, and partner, and trying to explain our first meeting fills me with intense emotion. It was very much a tale of two cities. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. Thank you for listening. This is episode 15. Thank you for doing this. Oh, my pleasure. I, I think I'm the most nervous about doing this interview with you than probably anybody I've talked to so far. Mm -hmm. Just the nature of the things we've been through. Yeah. That mm -hmm. we've seen each other go through. Mm -hmm. that we've experienced together, all of what that means and has meant to our lives. Mm -hmm. And regardless of how many years have gone by, I feel like I can go right back to that 19-year-old person in a heartbeat. As I thought about people who have lived in the arena and have learned how to live a courageous life, whether they wanted to or not. I think you lived courageously before we met, but circumstances in our lives meant that we were thrust into it. Yes, absolutely. So here we are. Yay. <laughs> I think these days, though, it's courageous just to get out of bed, honestly. Mm -hmm. I hear what you're saying about the circumstances and situationally how, speaking for myself, I've been at the crossroads of either surrendering to the pain or finding a way to live alongside of it. I think there are different things that make us have to dig down deep to get us through the day. But yes, when we were younger, there was so much so soon and too young. But I think it's hard to say that one is worse than another. Not that you're saying that, but I find that in my life, there's a kind of a hierarchy that's apparent to me in suffering. And so people say, because of what you've been through, you have so much courage to have gone through it. And I just, I've never understood that because I think you can't compare one to another. We tend to pedestalize certain people's suffering over other people's suffering. So the person who maybe just lost a parent, which is the natural order of things, do they have less courage than me who suffered an assault in the way that I did? I can't say that's true, though I think that people tend to say that's different. That's what everyone has to go through. What you went through is outside of the natural order of things. So therefore, your courage is profound. And I, I just, I find that I have to push against that because I don't believe that's true. I was listening to an interview that you gave, and I can't remember exactly the words they use. It wasn't companion, but that's a word that I use, mm -hmm. making friends with fear, making yeah living alongside of it and yeah, accepting right. that it's going to be there and it right. is there all the time. Right. And yeah. It, I think of it as a hum, like mm. it's a hum. It's an ever present hum, like mm. tinnitus. It's just there. And sometimes it's loud and sometimes in its loudness, it paralyzes me. And there's two or three days that I can't get out of bed. And sometimes it's very soft and almost barely audible in its absence is its presence. So I'll recognize that it's soft and by that, I recognize its presence. So it's never absent, even in the quiet. I'll notice things like, oh, my brother's laughing really loud the way he used to before all of this. Or I'm feeling really happy in my heart instead of, and it's, damn, there it is. And that surrendering has been a lifelong, truly lifelong journey to just accept, yeah, I woke up in the wrong life for sure that night in that apartment. But I can't mourn that I'm in the wrong life. I simply have to accept that I'll never be that person I was supposed to be without that trauma, but I am that person now. And it's the longing and the trying to reach for her, the before girl I call her, that has caused me so much suffering. And now I don't reach for her. I just accept that I'll never meet her again. And the after girl is the one I have to put my attention to. And it's been a long journey. I think that's been the most courageous part is to have just accepted. Acceptance is courageous. Just going, I, I can't affect change. I simply cannot affect change. What is that wonderful 
AA thing, the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. I don't know if it's serenity. I'm always fighting. My spirit is a fighter, so I don't have any serenity. But I do feel like the acceptance of that girl never coming back has been the most grieving that I've done in this process and the courage to just go, yeah, she isn't coming back. And to look that straight in the face and go, there's nothing I can do about it. Once again, you and I have jumped right in the middle <laughs> of the conversation. <laughs> I feel like we've you know, run alongside the train and just jumped on the car. So for the listener's benefit, I'm just going to step back for a moment and just... <sighs> it's okay take your time introduce my friend Pamela I think it's been harder to introduce somebody that I feel like I know so well that I lost I lost touch with you yeah for many years Mm -hmm. And yet when I saw you again for the first time in 15 years, yeah, 20 years, it was simultaneously like reuniting with a long lost sister. Yes. But also so much of our lives had gone off in their own directions. It's like the events were missing, but the feeling was the same. Pamela, thank you for being a part of this first season and congratulations on your new film, Happy Place, for which you you wrote the play and then adapted it for the screen. And you also played one of the characters. And there's so much to cover in such a brief amount of time, but welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Linda. I'm so proud to be part of it. Your new adventure. Yes. I don't know where it's taking me, but I'm certainly <laughs> enjoying the journey. So thank you for being a part of this. You're welcome. So we jumped in the middle of our story, the story of how all of us travel through the arena at some point. I guess I'm curious, going back to well before I knew you, what was conversation like around the dinner table in the Sinha household? Oh, that's such a good question. I always think of my childhood as, as really happy. I think around the dinner table was always very lively. My parents were extremely involved in our school news. Nothing was too banal. Everything was really interesting. They're very goal-driven people. So they were really interested in what we were learning. But it was always a rush because they were parents who really believed in extracurricular activities. So there was hockey for my brother and there was dance class for me and there was drum lessons for my brother and there was ballet class for me. And we were constantly running around. When I think about it, it just exhausts me. I don't even think Saturday was a day off. I think Saturday was my ballet, but my Indian classical dancing was in the evenings after school. It was just nuts. So it was a lot of conversation about us. I felt very much like my brother and I were the stars of the family and my parents' lives revolved around us. We monopolized conversation. And what was really funny is we were fluent in Bengali, but we didn't want to learn how to write and read. And so my mom and dad started spelling things around the table so that we couldn't understand it. And that got us very manipulatively, got <laughs> us interested in learning how to read and write. So that was pretty fun. That went on for about a year where they would suddenly start spelling things so we couldn't understand it. <laughs> so that was supposed to be like a thing where we would speak Bengali at the dinner table, but it was hardly ever enforced. So it was something that they played with a lot. So it was fun. It was a fun childhood, very fun childhood. And your mother is a gifted storyteller, dancer, your father. A statistician and a musician in his heart. He gave up playing the sitar. He was extremely accomplished, but he was, this gives you some sense of the immigrant mindset. He was a professor. He came to Canada in the 60s as an associate professor and ended his career as head of the department. But he was a very accomplished musician and he gave it up because he couldn't bear to be mediocre at something he loved. So I think that giving that up, he just made a choice to be a provider for his family back home, a provider for us, let us do anything we wanted to in our lives, study anywhere in the world. And 
he would be able to support us financially in that because he gave up being an artist, but he married an artist and he mm -hmm. raised two children that were very deeply into the arts. Daddy was like one of few parents who would fly in for every single goddamn public presentation <laughs> of anything in first, second or third year. He was very into it, but um, terrified that we would become artists because he saw it as a life of suffering and starvation and which it is. <laughs> he wasn't wrong. But yeah, they were very artistic, both of them. Daddy more in his soul, my mother more in action. And that drive was most certainly passed along to both of you. Oh, yeah, for sure. That drive to yeah. be the best you possibly can be in everything that you attempt. Mm -hmm. I listed your many yeah. accomplishments at the beginning, yeah. and you were a theater artist in film and television, and having been your roommate, yeah. every opportunity you were given, you were not going to take it lightly. You understood the opportunity that was being handed to you. Yeah, I did. But the gift that I feel I got from them beyond, yes, drive and ambition and goals and all that. But I think that the gift I got was to do it with love. In Hinduism, there's karma yoga, which is the, the worship that you do in service of something. And they were never into going to temple on certain holidays or being a good Hindu. Like that wasn't their thing. Their jive was not that. They were if you do your studying with your full heart, there's no greater worship for the creator than that. I always felt like if you can't do it with love, don't do it. Mm. Same thing like when I quit ballet. It was the first thing I ever quit in my life. And I was 17 when I quit. And I was very serious. I didn't feel like a failure. I just told them I don't love it anymore. It's time for me to move on. And that's when I started doing Indian classical dance very seriously. There's no failure in that. It's you're in service to something you love and that is your worship. And if it is anything less than coming from you simply for the sake of being great at it or being the best at it, then that's not spiritual. That's not an offering anymore. That becomes about ego and you. So I feel like they're not the typical immigrant mentality of achievement. It's much more considered and it's a loving ambition as opposed to a hard and cruel pushing of your children. I remember how just the act of cooking a meal yeah. for us and yes. <laughs> how much love they brought to to us in the time yeah. that they were with yeah. us. Yeah. They were proud of us. They were really proud. Mm -hmm. They were proud we were living together. They were proud we were buying groceries. They were proud of every little thing that we were doing as young people. They were proud of us. And there was room in their heart for all of you mm -hmm. who were part of my life. And also the part that you haven't spoken about, you're very sensitively letting me enter into it, but I was a survivor of rape, a very brutal rape. And I was taken hostage by a maniac for several hours in an apartment before I met you. And uh, that was just months after our living together was just really just months after that happened in July. And you became my roommate in September. No, that's not right. You were my roommate the following year. So the a year, year later. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, second year. But so a year, less, like just a year later. And uh, I think they saw that, speaking of courage, an act of courage to live and love me at such a young age when they knew that living with me was a complicated endeavor. Whether we talked about it or not, I think they were very aware of the safety that I felt living with you. What event in your life has had the most profound impact? And there seems like there's an obvious answer to that, but yeah, mm -hmm. I will allow you to choose because there have been many events in your life since then. Yeah. I'd say the most devastating one would be the rape, for sure. It's changed everything in my life and the lives of people I love. And it is a constant, using your word, companion. Its presence and its absence, like I say, is constant. And I would say the most joyous event in my life is becoming a, a parent to my stepdaughter, Chloe, who I met when she was three years old. And she's like the best thing that ever happened to me. People ask me, D didn't you ever want to have children of your own? And I always answer, she is my own. Like she's not my child by default. She's always been an active choice to me that I've wanted a child my whole life and I got one. And I'm a one parent 
a one child parent and she fills our lives and she makes me happy. And even when her father and I broke up, and we've now gotten back together, but the six years we were apart, her parents had been adamant that my place in her life is unchanging, that I remained very much a co parent in those years apart. So there was never any blip. She's the best constant I have. What does living courageously mean to you? I think living courageously is the act of living your truth. And it's a very hard thing to do. It sounds so easy and and that term seems to be extremely popular. But when you really sit down and think about it, to try to honor not just your feelings, but your principles, to see yourself, to be attentive in a way that is not egocentric, I hate this whole self-care thing. I don't get it. I just, I find it just really, <laughs> oh, whatever. It's just such a privileged term. But I'm, I'm talking about attentiveness to oneself so that we can be better for each other. And um, sometimes that means having really hard conversations. Sometimes it means not talking, just listening. Sometimes it means being open to a different point of view. Sometimes it means surrendering to the fact that you can't fix it for someone you love or even yourself, and just accept and be there and be open to what you don't know. I think doubt is very healthy in that courageous living. And it's very different to be brave with what you don't know. Be willing to sit there in what you don't know and be willing to learn takes a lot of courage. Living with uncertainty. Yes, exactly. The acceptance around uncertainty. We hold on more tightly to what we know in the face of what we don't know. What does that do if I doubt my certainty? Listen, I'm talking the talk, but it's very hard for me to do that, to accept that maybe there's another (laughs) something else that I'm missing because I'm so sure of my principles and I'm so sure of what's right and I'm so sure about how people should behave in a certain situation that makes me come across as enlightened and thoughtful, but actually that certainty is uh, ignorance. I have to be willing to go, I could be wrong about, I'm pretty sure about this, though I could be wrong. And certainty is very closely aligned with safety. Yeah, of course. The known quantity. Unknown is terrifying. Yeah. So to venture into the unknown in matters of love and work and identity, that's a big ask of yourself, but Wouldn't that be something if we could all do that? There would be so much more compassion in the world. We're very hard on ourselves. You, I know. And me too. We're very hard on ourselves. And sometimes it's good to give yourself a break. You don't know. You don't have the answers. You don't always need to have the answers. Be surprised by your doubt. What happens then? When I think about my 19-year-old self, 20-year-old self, I guess, when you and I were living together, I think I really struggled with trying to fix it. Mm -hmm. trying to fix what was happening to you, to me, to the whole situation. I wasn't afraid of the emotions, but that there needed to be a solution or there needed to be a way of living that was going to make it okay. Yeah. And there just wasn't. And being okay as the listener, as the witness to the pain that you were going through Mm -hmm. and trying to sit in that place of uncertainty and fear and deep pain. That's a harsh lesson to learn at such a young age. We are struggling with it now. Mm. I can't fix you. I can't fix the person I love. I can't fix their life. I can't fix my life. I can't like, we're struggling at it as grown women, but you were faced with the dark truth. That is true. You can't fix it at such a young age. And that's just mind blowing to me. You were younger than Chloe. Like, That's just crazy to me how young we were. And that's a harsh thing to have to learn your utter helplessness. Because when you're young, you think you're in charge of everything, right? The world is your oyster. You are the captain of your ship, the master of your destiny. Everybody doesn't know anything or everything. That's part of being 20, right? Those are your 20s. You're like rolling your eyes at everybody who isn't your age. Mm. And then for you to have to come home to that harsh reality of I'm helpless in the face of this. I can only be a witness, which truly was the best thing you could have been because I was so secretive because I believed I could maintain this idea that I was fine when I was in public. And when I wasn't in public, I wasn't. And you had the brunt of that and you did it. I did it ish. 
You did it. Well, no, you did it. No, don't do that. No, you did it. That is a, I didn't even know what you were doing, but I know that it helped me get through those two years we were living together. We, we had this conversation a little while back about your experience being an artist in Canada mm-hmm. versus my experience of being an artist. I never pursued it, let's mm-hmm. be frank. But my, was it willful blindness? Was it my privilege that I didn't see how different your trajectory was going to be? Because I always saw Pamela, who was the incredibly driven, mm-hmm. powerful, passionate, gifted artist that was going to change Canadian theater. Mm-hmm. But she couldn't get into the audition room to change mm-hmm. it. Yeah. And that's the part that I didn't acknowledge. And I have acknowledged it to you privately, but the courage that it has taken you every step of the way of your career to mm-hmm. keep going forward mm-hmm. and keep believing and c- keep that dream alive within you. How could you know, though? I didn't even know it. Mm. I honestly thought I was graduating from the National Theatre School with a whole career ahead of me. I had no idea it was going to be different for me. So how could you have known it was going to be different for me? You couldn't mm. have. We weren't prepared the way that generation that comes out of theater school is now and how aware they are, how politically aware they are, how they recognize things and they question things, not only as people of color, but as white people. And I, and they recognize that being a person of color is not the same as being black. You can't lump us all together. The black experience is ex- extremely distinct from my experience as an Indo-Canadian woman. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There's some crossover, but it's very different. So all of that, how could you have been aware of it? I I really wasn't aware of it. And I think that was the devastation is why can't I get in the audition room? I don't get it. I'm the right age. I'm a good actress. And they don't want to see me. And that was really hard. So I don't know if I stuck with it. I think I just switched to television acting because they didn't seem to have that issue. Pre-9-11, They just thought I was a cat's meow and I just couldn't stop working. And I remember there was a teacher at the National Theatre School who had mentioned to the class behind us that I was a sellout because I was doing television. Like that whole kind of heartbreak of, yeah, am I a sellout because they said I was and I'm doing television. I'm not pursuing a career at Stratford. I wasn't getting parts at Stratford. Mm -hmm. I wasn't even getting in the door. Richard Manette didn't want to see me until I shamed him into seeing me. And then he had to see me. You're going in the room knowing full well, you're not going to get the part. So yeah. I, and then I, I went on that trajectory of television for 10 years. And then of course, everything changed with 9-11 because then it was suddenly terrorist moms and shit like that. So then I quit TV yeah. and went back to theater. So it's been a journey. It's certainly been a journey, but I'm really grateful that it won't be the same journey for other 20 year olds of color. And there are opportunities and recognition that they deserve, especially when you're that young and vulnerable. They don't need to go through that rude awakening that I did. How do you continue to grow? I don't know if there's a how to in that. I just do. And, and I think a lot of it has to do at the risk of repeating myself is really trying to embrace now in my life what I don't know. I've just had to be so fierce about my PTSD and my depression and how I need to be in the world in order to be in the world. That's taken such a ferocity. Those things I know, those things I know I've practiced, I've fallen apart. I've been put back together again. I've been hospitalized. I've been divorced. I've been through so much with that alongside of me that I feel a tremendous excitement at opening myself up. Instead of going, I don't know how to write a film, I collaborated with people who go, yes, you do, because you've written enough, you've seen enough to know and experienced enough to know what is a bad film. How do you make a good one with the challenges before you? Like, you've never written one before. I don't know, but I'm inspired by what I don't know. And I believe I'm not changing course, I'm expanding. There's no limit to what we are just keep going. So such a gift now, embracing the uncertainty. It's almost bring it on. Yeah, bring it on. I just need to do the show that I want to tell. I want to tell the story about that generation that came as young people, not as the butt of our generation's jokes, 
I, I want them to be complex, unlikable, so sexy. I look at these pictures of my mom and dad with the see-through saris and the cigarettes and the scotches. And I just go, where the hell are those immigrants? Hmm. And they aren't just Indian, okay? They're just not. <laughs> and it was a very special time in this country. It was a shaping of a nation and everything we've inherited came from that courage. And I have never seen the generation who's now in their 70s and 80s as young people represented in Canadian culture. I've seen a lot of the old grannies and parents going, marry this boy, forget it. My mom and dad never said marry this boy as long as they lived. They were too busy living their lives and dealing with much more complex situations than arranged marriages. So I'm driven by that. And I don't know what's next after that. I really don't. I, I don't know if I'm going to write another film or write another series or not write at all and just embrace acting again. I don't know, but that's okay. I just need to do this right now. What's your legacy? Oh my gosh, Linda. I don't have one yet. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have one yet. What would you like it to be? I think it would be that in reading my work, like Crash or the short story Hiding and Happy Place, the film, because I haven't quite created the television series yet, but I, when I look back at that, and I think of my legacy in terms of work, is that in reading those or having access to those offerings I've left behind, that man or woman who reads it feels a little bit less alone in whatever it is that they're feeling. Mm. I think that would be really something, because I didn't have those things when I was suffering. I didn't have any books to read or plays to read or stories to read. I felt very much alone in my grief. Outside of the love that I had, I didn't have any hope that I could make anything of beauty with what I carried. And I have. And I hope other people see that in themselves, that they're not alone and they, make and th they can make things of profound beauty while carrying and acknowledging the suffering. What would you do on your last day? My last day. This is assuming I'm old and everybody's gone before me that's older than me. I want to see my daughter's face and all the children that I love, all the children that make up my heart. I would just love to sit with them and hear them talk and tell stories and just be with them and know that our life continues on in the lives of the people we love, that it doesn't end with death. It just continues in a different form. I think love is the legacy, really. That's what I aspire to. People think of my name and think love. Is there anything else you'd like to share before we wrap up? No. I think I'm just surprised and delighted by the fact that uncertainty has become a running theme in this conversation because we never discussed it. You just emerged. And I think that's a meaningful conversation and a meaningful thing to think on. I think it carries a lot of power. So I'm delighted by that because I didn't see that coming. <laughs> and I'm very proud of you. When I was talking about uncertainty and walking a path that I haven't walked before and being willing to be wrong and all of that, you've done all of that and more in the last year of your life. And it's wonderful. It's a wonderful thing to witness. I feel like all the witnessing you did for me when I was younger, I'm now witnessing you. And I'm watching and I'm listening and I'm so privileged that we've made the connection again so that I can truly be a very proud ally and witness to all the change you're making and all the risks you're taking. It's really, you're a wonder. Thank you for that. You're welcome. Uncertainty has been a central theme in that change, in making those choices and accepting that I am simply not going to know what the next steps are until they appear. And I just put one step in front of the other. There is no benefit really in worrying about what the future is because it simply will be. Yeah, that's right. Thank you so much for this. Oh, you're welcome. What a pleasure. <laughs> An absolute pleasure. Thank you so much, Linda. Thank you for listening. Please subscribe. And if you feel someone else might benefit from listening to this episode, please share it. Leave a rating or review wherever you listen to your podcasts. If you would like to follow my blog about courage, creativity, and change, or learn more about what I do, 
please visit my website at www.lindamclaughlin.com. I would love to hear from you. My next and final episode of this season will be some reflection on what 2020 has taught us and what our hopes are for 2021. Until next time, my name is Linda McLaughlin in the arena.